Hey, so last week I made a video about how, in space, accelerating your spacecraft in a straight line can produce the sensation of artificial gravity. It ended up being an excuse to autistically monologue about the expanse, but today I'll be moving beyond that topic and talking about getting artificial gravity from rotation instead, considering rotation is vastly more feasible, more practical, more useful, more efficient. It's really just better in a vast number of ways. Spin artificial gravity is to linear artificial gravity what a real-life AK-47 is to a cool laser gun drawn on a sheet of toilet paper. Rotational artificial gravity doesn't rely on any kooky pants on head sci-fi bullshit. We can achieve rotational artificial gravity with modern materials, and even if we end up in a future with the ability to do linear artificial gravity, I still think rotational will be broadly more useful, at least partly because you don't have to be hurtling increasingly quickly in one particular direction for it to work. Like what if you want a space station with artificial gravity? You're gonna use linear acceleration for that? How? If you're making a station, the station kind of needs to stay where the station needs to be. Instead of constantly speeding up to push your feet into the floor, just have the floor be rotating around a central point that's above you. If the floor, and therefore you, are rotating around that point, your inertia wants to keep you moving on the straight trajectory you're on at any given moment, but the floor is constantly running into you and exerting a force that pushes you around in a circle. Isolate this effect on its own, where you're not on the surface of a planet and therefore also fighting quote-unquote real gravity, as the mainstream media will have you call it, and spinning around really feels a lot like gravity. It's like being on a merry-go-round, except the force of the merry-go-round is the only force at play, so you can just consider the outer edge to be the floor and stand up against it. I think the coolest thing to do at this point would be to go through some of the most fundamental architectures I've identified for rotational artificial gravity that you could base a space station on. Listen up, because this might be on the test. And by the test, I mean the overwhelming majority of the entire future of human civilization. Okay? Okay, there's some wiggle room for splitting or unifying these in various ways depending on your preferences, so let me know if you think you'd group these differently, or if you think I missed any. The ones I came up with are a tethered system, a cylinder, a torus, and a ring. A tethered system might be what immediately came to mind if you're into kinky shit like a sick little fuck. Yeah, come here. <laughs> The tethered system is probably the easiest one of these to do in the first place since it can be lightweight and launched on a small rocket. It's the only one we've done in reality so far, just barely. It basically consists of two masses separated by some distance with a tether holding them taut. If you spin them, they should rotate around a common centre of mass, creating a perceived sensation of gravity for the people situated within one or both of the containers involved. The only problem with this is how tremendously flimsy and impractical the entire system is. I've seen arguments for flat Earth more substantial than this fucking thing. How would you dock to a space station space like this. Chase the containers in a circle? Sounds like a premise for some sort of 22nd century Looney Tunes cartoon. Gemini 11 was the first and so far only test of artificial gravity in space, and they got a capsule with some dudes in it, and a counterweight, and a 30 meter tether, and they spun the whole thing very slowly. They built up a grand total of 0.00015 g's of artificial gravity before fucking up and losing slack on the tether. This whole tether system is, if I'm honest, a bit wank, so let's go ahead and move on to better ideas. The second design is a cylinder. This one might be the most immediately intuitive to my fellow based, scientifically level-headed, giga-chad, hyper-optimal galaxy brains out there. When you think about something rotating to create gravity, the most obvious way of doing so is to cut the overcomplicated tether situation out and just reduce your design to the simplicity of a gently rotating Pringles can. So let's talk equations. If you want to create a specific amount of force, say 1g, you can tweak the radius of the space station, or you can tweak the spin rate. As you increase the radius of the spinning station, you also have to spin it faster to make the same amount of g-force but the amount you need to spin it faster by doesn't scale up as quickly as it would need to to keep the RPM the same. So if you were to put a little spinning station next to a big one, and both were producing 1G, the little one would be spinning at a way higher RPM, but the big one would actually be moving faster in terms of sideways velocity. Just to put some numbers on this, a station 100 meters in diameter, as in you could look up and see people walking around on the surface above you 100 meters away, would need to spin at 4.2 RPM. But a station 1000 meters across, or 1 kilometers in diameter, would only need to spin at 1.3 RPM. However, despite that smaller station having a faster RPM, the speed it's spinning at would only be 80 km per hour, whereas the 1 km station would have to be spinning at 252 km per hour. While changing the radius and the spin rate would change the forces on the spacecraft, how long or deep you make it wouldn't, which is why the concept of an O'Neill cylinder solves for some ideal diameter and spin parameters and then just kind of makes the whole thing as long as it needs to be to have the number of people in it that you'd want to have. Some of the ideas for spinning cylinders 
cylindrical habitats can be several kilometers across because the cylindrical configuration of all the ideas I'll discuss here is arguably the most ideal for enclosing habitats intended for permanent, mostly self-sufficient habitation. Cylinder habitats are the universal space crib to keep all your space bullshit in so you can invite over your space bitches. It's theoretically possible to use existing materials to make a cylinder habitat like this, capable of supporting a population and GDP similar to a small nation, like we're talking a potential capacity in the region of millions of people. The material strength requirements for rotational habitats at 1G are about the same as you'd expect for a suspension bridge on Earth at the same length as the habitat's circumference. So while very big cylinder structures might need a thicker hull, or maybe they'll aim for slightly lower artificial gravity than 1G, they're definitely within the realms of possibility. If you can build a bridge of a certain length, you can pretty much definitely build a habitat of that circumference. Realistically, even more than that, considering the ease of constructing things in artificial gravity and the sheer quantity of resources you could extract from the moon or an asteroid without having to worry about f***ing up any delicate ecosystems. To get into and out of a cylinder habitat, you'd put a little urethral opening looking as f***ing airlock onto the rotational axis. When a spaceship enters, it can just hang out by the central axis in weightlessness, and a person could disembark that ship and descend onto the surface using an elevator, and then when you got to the bottom, you'd experience the full gravity. Although I will give it about five minutes before someone flings themselves off the central axis in a squirrel suit or with a pogo stick shoved up their ass or some other oddly human behaviour. You don't have to make these habitats giant, but one of the pluses of choosing to do so is the ability to put large multi-story structures inside and have all those people in buildings experiencing more or less the same amount of gravity as the people walking on the surface. As you get closer to the axis of rotation, the circle you're tracing out due to the rotation is smaller, so you experience less artificial gravity. If you were to make a habitat like this really small, small enough that the entire thing is essentially the size of a big room, the difference in artificial gravity between your head and your feet would be substantial enough that you'd start to notice, and it'd make it hard to walk without losing your balance and eating shit into the floor. Also, the larger habitat, since the RPM for equivalent artificial gravity is lower, you don't get as many weird Coriolis forces that would screw with people's intuitions of how objects ought to move. Like in a small rotating habitat, if you throw a dart at a darts board, the dart might seem to curve in unexpected ways, causing you to miss, which would be a better excuse than slipping in the shower if you found yourself needing to go to the hospital with one of them lodged up your ass. In nerd terms, when you're rotating, you're in a non-inertial reference frame, and in non-nerd terms, physics ooga booga. These Coriolis forces reduce in larger rotating habitats with equivalent gravity and could be absent for all practical purposes if the habitat is big enough. So yeah, the best use for a cylinder is on city scale projects at least, if not larger. One of the features of a cylinder habitat is the continuity of space all the way through the axis of rotation, which allows for a population to build very high, creating very dense urban environments to cram as many insufferable bipedal mammalian twats into as possible. Since there's so much gas, these habitats could support cloud systems and weather, and the central column could contain a lighting element that simulates sunlight. Sorry to interrupt, this is just a quick message to say, statistically speaking, you're probably not subscribed, so I'll make you a deal. Press the subscribe button and I won't come over to your house and do this. <coughs> Alright, thanks. Back to the video. My third design is the torus. This is what you might first think of if you're oddly keen on keeping things separate from each other. Maybe you keep all the things on the dinner plate in their own little piles. Maybe you shrink wrap the furniture before anyone comes over. Maybe you can take any innocent conversation and make it uncomfortably racial almost immediately. Here's one Werner von Braun did earlier. That said, when I look at this, I just get hungry. Space donut. Fuck yeah. Time to get topologically educated, you fucking fox. A torus configuration works similarly to a cylinder, except instead of having a continuous space filled with gas, you isolate the circumferential area. To, to come, circum, circumferential? Is that a word? You isolate the circumferential area and a small volume of space above it within a pressurized tube. I figure the actual reason you'd want to make these is if having a separate zero G section is something you'd want in addition to a section which experiences full gravity. If you're just building a space habitat for a million people to live in, the cylinder is probably better. This is due to the nuanced fact that cylinders aren't known for having a big empty fucking hole in them, but a torus shines when you need to incorporate a second area in a low gravity environment into the station, something like a docking port for spaceships. In a torus configuration, the torus will probably need to have some kind of spokes linking it to the central axis, since the central axis is kind of the only place you could dock to, it's the only effectively stationary place. Having some spokes would also help with the structural rigidity anyway. One of the things you could do is have, at the axis, a section which is unpressurized and have a hole bored right the way through it directly along the axis to allow spaceships to enter and egress. Imagine you're flying towards a rotating station. You'd float your spaceship into the port by entering the central axis and then touch down on a landing platform with the rotational circumference much 
lesser than the size of the Taurus itself, meaning the artificial gravity forces present on your spaceship would be much less than the presumably 1G being generated in the Taurus section. This would make it pretty easy to slowly manoeuvre to land, and the slight G-force will then still be enough to hold the ship down without you having to use clamps. Once you land, you can get out and work on your ship in the comfortable low gravity environment, and then either enter the station through an airlock and an elevator ride, or get back into your ship and fuck off into the distance without needing to use much propellant whatsoever. There'd be a very small minimum thrust requirement to get off the pad due to the low artificial gravity here, and there's not necessarily any airlocks or aerodynamic considerations to contend with either. The delta V requirement of getting between different stations like this would be pretty tiny. To leave, you'd simply provide enough thrust to separate from the station's slow rotation, manoeuvre back towards the central axis, and then eagle at whatever speed suits you. It would probably be a good idea to have a specific ingress side and a specific egress side of the station to simplify the traffic arrangement. You wouldn't want to cause a head-on collision between a hydrogen tanker and an anti-hydrogen tanker. That'd be a fucking awkward insurance form to fill out. Taurus designs are great for incorporating docking port sections like this, whereas in a simple cylinder design, you're going to have to go through an axial airlock and then fly through the atmosphere and presumably dock to part of the axial strut on the inside. Of course, you could just include the whole docking section as we've described for the Taurus station, just tacked on the end of a cylinder, you'd have to make do with a single opening for both ingress and egress in that case, since one end would have to lead into the cylinder, but that setup could work. That said, it's starting to blend together multiple elements and I'm trying to keep these all separate for the sake of defining clearly which station architecture is which. I'd say adding a separate docking port segment to a cylinder habitat is potentially advisable, but it's ultimately an optional extra, whereas with a Taurus station it's basically integral to the whole design premise, so fundamentally a Taurus station is great for incorporating these large docking ports. The nature of what it's like to live in both these styles of habitats is pretty different. In the cylinder, you can only see inside of the cylinder. Now, there's lots of designs that do include windows and large mirrors to reflect sunlight in, but I'm less keen on those designs, since I tend to think efficiency is the name of the game, and you're potentially wasting up to half of your land area if you just use these huge strips as windows. If you opt to light this via an axial light element, like I think would probably be the preferable way of doing it, then it basically creates a closed-off habitat the size of a, well, potentially the size of a country. It would be really crazy to be inside one of these things. Imagine being able to see all the other cities in your country rather than having a picture or map in your head. It'd be good for creating a sense of community. In a Taurus design, however, from the perspective of being inside one of them, there'd be a ceiling above you. In this case, there's not much to lose by just making that ceiling out of glass, so you could have a pretty great view of the outside. Of course, the view would rotate, but on a large station where the spin is fairly slow, this shouldn't make people dizzy or anything. Ultimately, it lets you see into space, see the planet you're potentially orbiting, see the ships entering and exiting the dock. If we draw a clear line, line between cylinder and torus designs, cylinders are for long-term habitation, and toruses are more places to be temporarily. I could quite easily imagine, in a few hundred years, a number of cylinder habitats in the L4 and L5 Earth-Moon Lagrange points, and to get there you fly out of some spaceport on the Earth in some spacecraft optimised for reusable trips to Earth orbit and then back again, and you spend a few hours flying in space, but instead of going straight to the cylinder habitat that you want to go to, you pull into a torus station, you get off the ship and hang around in the torus section for a while, the ship you came in, deal orbits back to the surface, and a separate ship, optimised for space transportation, pulls into the dock. You go back to the dock, you board the space transport, and you depart for the cylinder. Tauruses are basically airports in space, as far as I can tell. Anyway, time for the last design configuration. This one goes out to all the f***ing nerds in the audience. Alright, do a little thought experiment with me. What were to happen if you were to make a 1G rotational cylinder habitat bigger? So big that there's a pressure gradient between the thicker gas experiencing more force near the circumference, and lower density gas near the axis of rotation. If if you made it big enough that there's a total vacuum at the axis, you could remove the airlock entirely and just have an open portal out to space, right? So what if you made the habitat even bigger than that? You could make the hole even bigger. What if you made the diameter of the habitat so large that the diameter is mostly the hole? Then you end up with a ring, and a ring habitat is cool because it's open, meaning a spaceship could rock up and land on the inner surface, much like it's descending through the atmosphere of a planet. It's more than large enough to not only have its own weather systems, but have a myriad of different climates and biomes on it. Even the smallest versions of of this design configuration could support well over a billion people. There's a bunch of examples of ring habitats in various pieces of sci-fi media, and the scales vary a lot between them. Some of them are actually not that far-fetched in terms of what could potentially be possible for humans to construct 
developed sometime in the next 10,000 years, given how our ability to industrialize space will be an exponential process once it gets started. One of the most famous examples in fiction is a Halo ring from the Halo video game series. Halo rings are meant to be about 10,000 kilometers in diameter, similar in diameter to your mother, but believe it or not, that's actually kind of on the small end for ring habitats. There is one smaller though, a bishop ring. It's an actual non-fictional proposal which is meant to be about 1,000 kilometers across. Since ring habitats need retaining walls to keep their atmosphere in, which would need to be about 200 kilometers tall or so, bishop rings are pretty fat compared to how the retaining walls tend to not be too noticeable on the bigger ring designs. In fact, since you'd be artificially designing all the terrain on a ring, probably carving terrain features out of lightweight aerogel or something similar and then just putting down a layer of dirt on top of it, a lot of the bigger ring designs call for mountain ranges at the edges of the rings to disguise the boundary walls. You could probably do this with a bishop ring if you made it deeper, so it's more like a bishop noodle, otherwise I imagine the mountains would eat into most of the living space. A bigger ring habitat is a culture orbital from the Culture book series about a highly advanced hedonistic post-scarcity society composed of many alien races. I've not read the books, but I imagine a society this perfect would descend into an empire of a quadrillion alien lesbians telekinetically finger-blasting each other all day. Based on my research, most of the culture races live on culture orbitals, which are just ring habitats that are large enough to rotate once per day that would pass on their home planet, whilst also retaining their home planet's gravity. So this means that each species' culture orbital varies a bit from each other, but they're all massive. For reference, a human culture orbital based on an Earth day and Earth gravity would be about 3.7 million kilometers across. The granddaddy of ring habitats is the ring world from the book Ring World in the Known Space book series. A ring world is basically a ring habitat which has a star in the middle and the livable area of the ring is all the way out in the habitable zone. So this thing is f ridiculously huge. It's not the size of a planet, it's the size of a planet's orbit. Since this design means there would be sunlight 24-7, there is also the need for a second inner ring with opaque and transparent sections in it which rotates at a different speed from the inhabited outer ring to produce a simulated day-night cycle. For this whole thing to work, a ring world style object would have to be so large and spinning so fast that the material strength of whatever you make it out of needs to be about as strong as the strong nuclear force, which is far beyond anything we could even theoretically manufacture, like carbon nanotubes or whatever. In fact, it's so batshit insane that if we were really desperate to make one of these, it would probably require some really intelligent workaround rather than just brute forcing the material strength. From what I can tell, realistically, we could build a rotating habitat more than 100 kilometers across out of steel, but beyond that, certainly anything bigger than a bishop ring really isn't feasible with regular old modern materials. But if we figure out how to mass manufacture carbon nanotubes and graphene and other high strength materials that we know are possible, but just an absolute pain in the ass for us to make right now, something halo ring sized is actually within the realms of possibility. Anyway, that's my basic overview of the different types of rotational artificial gravity architectures. Now, have I mentioned every conceivable configuration of artificial gravity? No. One of you beautiful bastards commented on my last video reminding me to check out what Vast is doing for their initial spin design station. And I had heard about their station modules, but what I hadn't heard about was the fact they plan to build a rod out of them and spin it like a f***ing hot dog being flung down a hallway. I needed to do the f***ing Wim Hof method to calm the f*** down when I just finished scripting this video, only to realise the first thing that someone brought up doesn't neatly fit into any of the categories I've listed. But there is all sorts of weird shit and edge cases out there that don't quite neatly conform to exactly a torus or a cylinder or whatever. I think I'd list the vast rod station as a cylinder, not because it's actually cylindrical, but because it's a topologically continuous volume with a gravitational area rotating about a circumference. It's like you just built one of the elevators for a very small depressing cylinder habitat and then got bored and called it a day. That said, this is a very pragmatic way to create a spin gravity station given our current pitiful level on the space engineering tech tree. I'll have to do a full episode going through the upcoming ideas for space stations because there's some cool ideas being thrown around and the International Space Station is aging like a sheet of moist cheddar draped over a radiator. Anyway, as always, Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you want, and I'll catch you next time. Over and out.